the, the contrast there. So that says the presence of joy with Jesus. And um, sometimes when David gets a chance to share, he will tell you some stories about the recent weddings that he has performed and just, you know, some things about his, his week that have happened. So I thought I would share with you my mom fail for this week. Um, did you know that press-on nails are coming back in fashion, that those are kind of popular? So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try press-on nails this week, and I picked out a really cute little pair of nice, short, white nails. You will notice I am not wearing them, because I put them on Wednesday night. By Thursday morning, one had already popped off, and I was like, okay, well, I clearly did that wrong, so I glued it back on and went about my whole day. And then that night for dinner on Thursday, Thursday is sometimes like, clean out the fridge night, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make a chicken pot pie because we had some baby carrots that were no longer lunchbox worthy, and I had like half a bag of pearl onions, and so I had chopped up the carrots and the celery and like a little vegetable chopper, and I went to, those were sautéing in the pan with the butter and getting nice and soft so that I could add in the leftover rotisserie chicken, and then I had a bag of like little peas and carrots in the freezer. And so as I'm dumping those in to this pan of little tiny celery, oh, there was a sad zucchini in there too. So little tiny uh, celeries and little white zucchinis and then pearl onions and then a little bit of carrots in there. I look in this and there are three nails missing. <laughs> so then I'm now stirring this pot for you know a good five minutes going, I'm going to choke one of my family members with these tiny little plastic white fingernails that are approximately the same color and shape and size as the celery and the onions. And I eventually found them in the freezer where I had been rummaging for all of those things, but I was determined to find them before you know I put liquid and cream and crust all on that because I knew that I would have never heard the end of that had I served press on nail pot pie. Um, but I was very happy to have found them. And so this morning, we are not going to talk about happiness, but we are going to talk about joy. So I want to start off by reading you some verses. Psalm 86, 4. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Psalm 97, 11. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Isaiah 61, 7, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double portion, and they shall have everlasting joy. Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And we will come back to this verse. Psalm 4, 7, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. Luke 2.10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And that last verse is normally a Christmas verse, and actually this morning in first service we sang Joy to the World. And I never am surprised at how, um, when Mike chooses the songs, how perfectly it lines up. Because that was great for first service to sing Joy to the World. And then even this morning, we just sang the words, um, I look to your face, Father, and we'll see more of that. But Joy to the World is a Christmas song. And that last verse is from the Christmas story. And that even still is appropriate. Because Christmas and God with us is something that happens all year long. And this picture right here is fitting for Mother's Day. It's called Kissing the Face of God. And I'm actually going to move this little prop here. Um, today isn't just Mother's Day. It is also Pastor David's birthday. It lined up this morning. So in first service, um, he unwrapped this. And so, but the reason why... I show you this picture this morning is because not only is this such a great picture of Emmanuel, of God with us, but it's a picture of 
the incarnation. And I want to be able this morning to focus on the interconnectedness of Jesus, his presence, and the joy that we are offered in that relationship. Incarnation, that's just a churchy word that we use to describe God in human form. My youth pastor, when I was in junior high, said it was God in a bod. And that is a gift, that God truly allows us to have a real relationship with him. Because if we didn't have God in human form, if we didn't have the incarnation, we would struggle in how to have a relationship with him. And this is David's favorite painting. But when you look at this, you can see the humanity of Mary, and you can see how close she was able to be with Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, her Savior. So Morgan Wesley, he is the artist, and he was inspired to paint this after he heard the popular song, Mary, Did You Know? There's a lyric that says, when you kiss your newborn baby, you kiss the face of God. So he's known for depicting his faith and his portraits. He's super talented. He's an award-winning. He also does um, a ton of like, Western American art and all kinds of like cowboy cool pictures and um, stuff like that. He was scouted right out of art school at 19 to paint for some production houses in Hollywood. And this week, I found out he also painted this. So it is also fitting that David loved his art. <laughs> And he didn't even know this, I didn't know this. So he painted this, and then he also has them for uh, Return of the Jedi and Empire. And so, who knew? Um, it's a circle. Do you remember those like commemorative plates? So I guess he had done a whole series of these for the studio. Um, so this is David's painting now that he gets to hang in his office. But not only did Mary get to kiss the face of Jesus, as his mom, but she got to rock him to sleep. She nursed him, she bathed him, she cared for him like any mother does. And I think he looks like he's about four months old in this painting, just about the time where their little personalities start to show up and they really truly do recognize you and then they want to play. Many years ago, we got to go to a um, ministry conference for youth youth workers, and we heard a presenter that was talking about how infants' brain works, how infants' brains work. And the same God that knows the exact number of hairs on your head, he also knows the exact neuro pathways that allow us to grow physically, allow us to grow a personality, allow us to grow in maturity in our faith. And so here's some interesting facts about brains. Did you know that a teenager's brain actually on a scan it looks very similar to a toddler's brain. That might not be just surprising. Um, when there is food and uh, pleasure, when there is sleep, when there is comfort, those, there are certain areas in a brain that will light up and they look very similar on a toddler's brain and then it happens again right as puberty hits in a teenager's brain. And then when there is distress, same thing. So that's not shocking if you um, have a teenager in your house. Another thing that will show up on an EEG is the brain activity that we get when, our, um, when a brain and a person looks at another person's face. Even from an early infant age, there is a measurable difference, especially for little girls, to be drawn to faces. And all babies are wired from birth to find faces. In fact, they can even tell that like, they will look at the top third of an object more so than the bottom third because that's where the face should be. And in a 2006 study, evidence can be observed in infants as young as three to eight months that female infants prefer, they've shown more visual interest in a doll or in other faces than they do in trucks. And the male infants want to look at objects moving through space as fast as possible. So balls, trucks, speed, motion. And so um, you may have seen this in action with your own kids or grandkids. 
that little girls will have a conversation and play with faces, or they are more able to sit still and have a conversation at a younger age, and boys want to take an object and they want to see speed. They want to fling that across the room and see how fast can I make this go. Now that's not to say that um, the other gender doesn't figure out that we need to see a face and we have those things. It's just the order that those, those um, maturities and those growth developments happen in. But regardless of gender, all infants want to connect with their caregivers. They want to seek out older faces than theirs that, were, that are able to provide for them. And they innately know that if they can find a face, they can learn from them. They can have their needs met. We can see that here. Now that simply may look like a game, but psychologists would label this as a brain building activity that can have an impact on a child's whole life. What's happening here is attachment. They are making a connection that is nonverbal, but it is lasting. And there's a sense of love and pleasure that is shared. And the infant is learning that they can not only rely on their parents for providing the things that they need, but also for an emotional and a fun relationship. But why don't we play peekaboo more? Can I get two volunteers? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you can panic a little bit? Like, she is not going to make us play peekaboo as a grown adult because there is no infant here, right? But if I had a baby here and I said, who would like to play peekaboo? You may do it, right? Maybe somebody would do it. But if I said, Gordon, I would like you to play peekaboo with you know, right? That would feel awkward and strange, right? Maybe if I bribed you with some money and said, okay, for a thousand dollars, I need two volunteers <laughs> to play peekaboo like nobody's business. And then you'd be like, okay, I'll do it. But we aren't ready to really like engage that same way with a grown adult or with an older child. Owen, do you like to play peekaboo? No, yeah, see? Because, I, this is my theory, we feel silly. We feel embarrassed. We think people are going to look at us and judge us and be ashamed. But if we are playing peekaboo with a baby, we do not care what that baby thinks of us, right? One of the um, fun things about being married to David is that babies love him. They think he just looks so cool, and so if we are out at dinner, um, if we are in line at a park at Disneyland, if we are in line at Kroger or Walmart and there is a baby, that baby is going to stare David down until they look at him. And he just knows it now, and so he will stare back at them. Um, and then they are, but they're unrelenting. You know, like when a baby gets to your eyes and then they just want to stare, stare at you? But we do the opposite now if we are adults. Like, you know if you're just kind of like staring out in the space while you're like waiting at an appointment and then you catch eye contact with a stranger, you look away, right? And you don't want them to see you looking at them. One time, we were actually having dinner at um, Disneyland in one of the restaurants. And Declan, when he was young, he had locked eyes with someone and he was determined, I am going to get this person to pay attention to me. And he did. And David and I realized what was happening and we were like, oh my goodness. Declan had caught eyes with Lou Diamond Phillips, the actor. And he was like, okay. So they were kind of playing restaurant peekaboo. Like he was like smiling at him. But if Lou Diamond Phillips had a different, had a fan look at him and do that, no, like he would not have engaged the same way because we feel uncomfortable sometimes. If there is not a good relationship already built by having strong eye contact with someone because we know that it is an intimate 
way to build a relationship. We'll look away, we'll pretend that we are doing something else if we accidentally catch somebody's eyes. Or maybe you've noticed that maybe that's not happening quite as often because we are busy looking at our phones and we are not just scanning the world for faces. The reason is we feel weird to be seen by strangers or people we don't know well. In the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 11, King David's psalm says this, You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's the joy word again. But before we get there, I want to look at that word, presence, because that is where the joy is found. In Hebrew, the word there is panika. It's literally the same word for face. So if you were to swap that word, presence, in this verse, it would read, in your face is fullness of joy. The same word, Hanukkah, is also found in Psalm 4, 6. It says, there are many who will say, show us some good. Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. Or Psalm 119, 135 says, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Now in this verse, we don't see face or presence, but the parallel here literally is your face make shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. I like how the voice translation reads, guide me to walk in the way you commanded because I take joy in it. So the word picture I see here is as if Jesus is like a flashlight and his face is illuminating our way to walk in the world. John 8, 12, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we can see that there is a connection between God's face, his presence, in Jesus being the light of the world. And we're using our human words and anatomy to explain something that is so abstract and beyond explanation. Does God really have a human face? No, but these are the words that we as humans can use to describe something that is so beyond our understanding. In the last couple of weeks, David's been sharing about holiness and God's glory. If you didn't hear those, messages. I would encourage you to go back and listen to those. But even last week when he talked about God's glory, Moses had asked God and said, let me see your face. Let me see your presence. And I knew what I was about to be sharing with you, and this has all been in my brain for a while. And so I told David, I said, you know, I wonder if God told Moses, no, you can't see my face because God still needed Moses to lead the people, and if Moses had had that intimate relationship with God right then and there, he would have been like, I don't want to do anything else, I just want to be with you. And God said, no, like, I have more for you. So you can see, the, you can see where I just was. So go back and listen to um, last week's message if you haven't heard that. But joy is that same type of abstract thing, like holiness or glory. It's so big. The word joy in that psalm in verse 1611 is mahot. And it's one of 18 words in the Hebrew scriptures used to describe joy. And it's only used in that verse. They have 18 different verse or 18 different words to describe joy because they can't contain the definition of joy in one word. We have one word joy in there, right? And that doesn't quite explain it. Like we need to explain it like this. We need to use this word. We need to use this word. And it's all of these things together explain what joy is. What do we normally think of when the world says joy? The world wants us to think that joy is just like hyped up happiness. It's it's more extreme. The word tells us that joy comes from God's presence. The world wants us to think that if we aren't joyful, we're doing life wrong. 
but the word tells us that joy is a place where there is no shame or judgment. Second Chronicles 7, 14, the Lord says to his people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. Joy isn't extreme happiness. Joy isn't circumstantial. And joy isn't just emotional. We like to think that it's happiness on steroids. The world's definition of joy can make us feel inadequate because joy is dependent on us working harder to have it. Or joy only happens when life's circumstances cooperate. But true joy can come when we allow Jesus to see us. For some of us, that means that we also have to see ourselves, right? And we can't bring in all of the baggage and all of our judgment and all of our shame with us when we go before Jesus. Sometimes I just look at them and I'm like, oh, they're so cute. 
cute when they're asleep, when they're not talking back to me or asking me for things or leaving dishes all over the house or their laundry or their backpacks, you know? But I just want to look at them. But if you were to wake that sleeping baby up and prop them up onto the diaper changing table and say, I need to explain to you how much your dad and I love you. We have been We've been waiting to meet you and have this relationship with you, and you are just so excited. We are just marveling at that. We made you, and you are part of us. And we just, we just want you to understand. They can't understand that. They cannot understand that love. But the relationship builds that love. That love attachment between a parent and a child actually changes their brain in early infancy that will still have effects on them as adults. It allows them to have healthier relationships as an adult when they have that healthy attachment as an infant. And sadly, we know that in this broken world, there are a lot of people that do not have those healthy relationships with their caregivers. Maybe there was trauma, maybe there was relationships that were broken, and those weren't able to continue. But when we have that relationship with Jesus, there is so much healing. And the light of the world is shining his face on us. And we can unpack all of that pain, all of that trauma. And we can, we want to say, well, look at all of this bad stuff. Look at why I am unworthy of your love. Look at what I've done in my past. And he doesn't see that. He's forgiven us. And he loves us. And that's where relational joy from being in the presence of God begins. It can surpass hurting. That joy can accompany us even in the midst of suffering and trials and hardships. We can experience Emmanuel. We can experience God with us in the midst of hurting. That is good news. That's good news for everyone, right? For people that are broken and are not in a good relationship right now with the Lord, that's what they need to hear, that there is no shame or judgment when they come before God. Um, you know, sometimes, or there's a movie clip out of one of the a trailer, one of the characters, um, she's like, well, I'm in a church. I think it's Jane Fonda for a movie. And she's like, I'm in a church. And the person on the other line of the phone is like, didn't burn down as soon as you're in it. Like that comes from people judging and thinking that they can't have that relationship with God, that they are not worthy of being with him. But this is such good news that Peter even preaches the, these words from this psalm on the day of Pentecost. He preaches to the masses that are there that do not know Jesus yet. And he says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He quotes Psalm 1611. So this is really abstract and great joy in God's face and be with Jesus. But how do we actually do it? How do we have joy in our daily life? How do we achieve this joy? Well, the first way is we are fruitful. Perhaps one of the most well-known passages of joy is in the New Testament. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's in Galatians 5, 22. And I've studied this passage for a while, and Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, giving them instructions on how to live a life that is free and fruitful, not a life that is ruled by the law and burdensome. How to turn from our flesh and the struggles that would distract us in this world to be believers in Christ. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And joy, it's right there, it's number two in the list. But what's interesting about this list of virtues is that they build upon themselves. They're not multiplying and growing. There's not that many different types of fruit. No, it's it's one singular fruit, and the fruit becomes more mature, starting with love. That's the foundation. And we have to know that we are loved by God. We have to accept that love and be able to be in that love relationship with our Creator. And once that's happened, then we receive joy. 
that same joy that we've been unpacking. Realizing that our joy isn't circumstantial. Instead, it transcends our everyday life. Because when we are loved by God, what else matters? Those circumstances and hardships fade away because I am just joyful to be in relationship with him. And when we can live our daily life from that perspective, we operate with a peace that passes the worldly understanding. So if we, as believers, can receive and then give love, joy, and peace, those foundational virtues, we can then become fruitful in a way that easily allows us to be patient, to be good, to be faithful, to be gentle, and to be self-controlled people. Those are the maturing parts of the fruit. The next thing we can do is we can abide. John 15, verse 11, Jesus is speaking, and he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be in you. What are these things that Jesus has spoken? Well, he's talking to his disciples in the upper room on the last night that he spends with them, and he's teaching them to abide, to abide, to remain close to him. Verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Like that bearing fruit is actually part of abiding. And so how do you actually really explain abiding well? Well, it's getting really close. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, your hearts, you double-minded. Now, I used to not necessarily like the second half first because I thought, well, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is a great thought. And then all of a sudden it's like, cleanse your hands, you sinners, like it's point. But that's the shame that we want to bring into it. But no, it's, I can't even go in his presence. I need to wash my hands first. It's not like you do it on your own. It's like, no, just come and he wants to be with us. Don't allow that to prevent you from drawing near. So when we can do that, when we can be fruitful, when we can abide, and when we can draw near, then we are able to find true joy that is available to us, this Emmanuel closeness. So I want to be able to read to you the verses again that I read to you at the beginning, the joy verses. And I want you to be able to listen and imagine the joy here, the closeness, and the presence of God, that we can seek his face and be able to delight in him and how that comes from nothing else. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Instead of your shame, there will be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to come to you and be so close to you. We want to be able to know that and to have that same face-to-face -face relationship with you. We want to be able to come to you without our shame or baggage. We want to just be able to be close and to be with you. And I just pray for each heart that's here and each brain that's here to not allow anything that we have to prevent us from coming, Lord, that we just want to be able to have that Emmanuel relationship with you. We want to be so close that we can see your face. Lord, we pray for our lives and our daily walk this week as we leave this place, that we would just be so